mistakes were made. That is the premise of this video. As I looked forward to reviewing the latest edition of D&D, which I affectionately called 5th edition, the 5thest of all editions, until a new 5th edition comes out. But that led me to ask a question. What exactly is wrong with it? I've done a video of why I fell out with the 5th edition, but a good chunk of that was subjective topics that were a matter of taste. As much as I disliked the boring Victorian art for a good chunk of the illustrations, there wasn't anything physically wrong with it. 5e is 10 years old, the longest run for any edition, beating Beck me by two years. The cracks in the game have long since been exposed, but is 5th or edition going to fix them? To know that, we must first see what went wrong with the game. Fortunately, I have been playing Dungeons & Dragons for a very long time, and I am not a stranger to its many problems. I will flat out state that there is no perfect edition of D&D. All of them have their issues. The first edition was almost a simulation, with more charts than needed, and some layout issues that naturally came with the first attempt at your mass-marketed product. This also gave us Unearthed Arcana, a book that tried to extend the life of the edition by rewriting or adding on additional roles that typically missed the mark. Almost every edition has its version of Unearthed Arcana, though obviously with a different name. Second edition had Skills and Powers. 3.5 gave us the Book of Nine Swords. Fifth edition gave us Tasha's. All of them effectively tried to improve the game, but all fell short and just signaled that the current edition was coming to an end. Second edition kept trying to add to the rules, giving us some broken books like the Complete Book of Elves or underpowered creations like the Barbarian's Handbook. 3.0 was so unbalanced it lasted the shortest of any edition. 3.5 kept with the cross-class skills and the ever-expanding attack bonus and eventually collapsed under its own rules. 4th edition tried to balance out all the classes, whether they needed to be or not. This was an addition to the MMO vibe that it famously gave out. Beckme kept welding on rules that didn't work with the original sets, even giving us the powerful negative level creatures to play that were, in reality, unplayable. It didn't help 2nd edition and Beckme that TSR's Death Spiral gave us some broken and incomplete books. I should know, I watched both of those editions die in real time. Now I could just rag on 5e's problems for this entire video, but I'm not one to focus on the negative. There's plenty of channels that do nothing but complain. On the other hand, I only want one thing out of my games, and that's absolute perfection. It's a small thing to want, considering I'm giving them money to entertain me. For everything wrong, I will at least try to explain what could have fixed it. Then we can compare notes when the people that buy their books in the store can finally look at it ourselves. All I can offer people who want to improve their game is my experience in running, playing, and designing mechanics. Fortunately for all involved, I've got more than enough of that for all of us. And before I start launching into everything it did wrong, 5th edition had its place in D&D. All the editions did. Each one presented a different kind of game. 1st edition, like I said, was the simulation. If you wanted to keep track of everything, this was your edition. 2nd edition was the all-you-could-eat buffet. It had something for everybody, and even in its most bloated, dwarfed the others in sheer variety. Back me was the hurry up and play. It had streamlined rules, and it didn't have as many options, but nothing else came close if you just wanted to throw dice in a hurry. 3.5 was for the number crunchers, which had more combinations than anything else and so much variety from opening up who could play what. 4th edition played like a board game and it was easy to understand. It's probably the easiest by far when it comes to online play. 5th edition was the superhero edition. Powerful characters almost from the start for people who like that kind of play. If you wanted to experience the tabletop version of the Capcom games, 5th edition did it best. Many of our complaints about 5th edition can be handled by just playing the version of the game that best suits your style rather than sticking to the current version. Having said that, there's a lot of things that 5e did poorly. Counting them down in no particular order. I might as well get this one out of the way first. Bounded accuracy is a broken mess. It sounds great on paper. Numbers are being limited to within a specific range. If you're a particular level, you get specific bonuses. This way a monster isn't going to outclass the party because its armor class is beyond what they can hit there will at least be a chance to succeed. But bounded accuracy works for monsters who will never change from their base formula rather than player characters. As written, a hobgoblin will always have the same armor class. Players can switch between chainmail and plate mail when they get the right amount of gold pieces. PC bonuses are always going to go up because that's what benefits them. If a topi needs a 13 to hit you with the armor you have on now and an 18 to hit you if you go to full plate, it's in your best interest to tank up as soon as possible. This has hampered Dungeon Masters because it restricted the kind of treasure they could hand out. Magic weapons and armor are now capped at plus 3 instead of plus 5, and you can only have 3 attuned items lest the game balance be disrupted. It's so bad that General Wisdom tells people trying to make new classes not to give them a default plus 1 because it breaks bounded accuracy. DMs must watch what they give out or else the monsters will have a hell of a time threatening the party. Characters rush towards the maximum bonus they can get, 
and with a limited numerical range, that's not hard. The solution is obviously to increase the range of the bounded accuracy, but that would require a rewrite of the game. It already has so little wiggle room with the numbers that instead of numerical bonuses or penalties, everything just becomes advantage or disadvantage. And that caps players trying to go above and beyond trying to get a bonus, because everything just boils down to one mechanic. Replacing almost all improvements to your character with a reroll isn't the solution. Try hard. Try again. Another thing that's almost reached meme status is the poor design of the races. No, I'm not calling them species. That sounds like a sci-fi term. I think they even named a movie after it. When the player's handbook came out, of the nine races, six had dark vision. Aziz, light! Four races or sub-races started with spells. The dark vision ratio has stayed about the same, with two-thirds of the races getting it, but the ones that got spells soared close to the 60% mark, and they started way behind. And there's a lot of crossover between those two abilities. Every race gets four abilities, but if two are the same or a variant of each other, there's not much difference in the races. Worse, if you get a race that gives you a tool, weapon, or armor proficiency, you don't get a replacement if your class or background also provides it. Races should be reasonably unique. If nothing else, they should have an ability that is specific to them. Halflings have luck. She generate their own illusions. Thrykirin do that forearm stuff. And elves have no gag reflex. Shared abilities like dark vision need a specific requirement for a race to get them. Dark vision is for subterranean races. Why are the surface dwelling high elves getting it? Because elves, that's why. I understand that racial proficiencies are gone and that's a good thing, but go a step further. Break down the races, give them unique racial bonuses, and come up with new abilities instead of repeating the same three racial abilities each time. And get rid of inherently magical abilities for core races. Leave those to the subclasses for reasons that I will get to shortly. Next up, it's no secret that the action economy is in shambles. When I'm looking specifically at the bonus actions. It's not to say the distribution of regular actions is off the hook. Monsters with a single attack are pretty much damage sinks for most parties. We're not there yet. Which one of y'all kick me? Ogres, I'm looking at you. A typical party has six actions, so even if a monster does a lot of damage, chances are it gets one swing. You would have to match monster for player character. Some of those monsters are supposed to challenge low-level parties by themselves. But then we get to the bonus action. At least the classes that get to use a bonus action. Mechanically, it's like the half actions of old, only with more restrictions. Some classes, like wizards or monks, get several uses of bonus actions. Other, like the fighter, only get additional bonus actions if they take specific subclasses. Fighters can use it for second wind and to make an offhand attack. You don't get a bonus action if you aren't a battle master, at full health or not fighting with two weapons. Clerics and paladins don't even get built in bonus actions with their core classes that aren't spells. They have to take specific subclasses or they don't even get the option to use one. Meanwhile, the monk can use a bonus action every round and arcane spellcasters have a list of spells that cast as bonus actions. Fifth or edition is at least in part addressing this as you can drink potions now as a bonus action. However, this still leaves the problem that some classes are effectively getting two actions a turn as a class feature, while others have to fulfill a specific set of requirements to use theirs. This might be fine for the famously underpowered monk, but wizards don't have that problem. Worse abilities that use the bonus action like dual wielding are harshly penalized for reasons. You can only attack with a specific weapon and don't get to add any damage bonus to it. The best solution is to give a particular bonus action to everybody, though this could lead to a false choices if one option is always better than the rest. You would need several choices that should be valuable in most situations. If a bonus action gives you a plus one to something, you need to include two other options that would also be equally useful. Furthermore, move some bonus actions to be included into regular actions at a certain level. Doing this has become so ingrained into your training that it's now innate. For example, if you have dual wielding at a certain level, now when you make an attack, you make one with your offhand weapon, one with your main weapon, and then you can use a bonus action for a second offhand attack. Next we get to the problem of gaining new proficiencies, as 5th edition is by far the stingiest of all in that regard. I'm talking about learning new weapons, saving throws, and skills. You can learn a new tool with simple study in your downtime. But what happens if you want to take a college course in first aid to gain the medicine skill? It's not possible. You get nothing! In every other edition before it, you selected a skill when you gain skill points. In fifth edition, you either have the skill or you don't. You're not learning any new ones except under very specific circumstances with either feats or certain class abilities. There's only 18 skills, so I'm guessing they didn't want people to try and collect them all. But that creates a problem, as this also applies to saving throws. When you make your character, you get two saving throws that you're good at. One of them is the useful saves in Dexterity, Wisdom, or Constitution. 
And the other one is one of the not so good ones. More on that later. But the issue is you can't get another unless you are on a very narrow list of classes or you buy one specific feat. And without a saving throw proficiency, you never get any better at them. That is unique with this edition. As in every other one, all of your saving throws got better as you leveled. Even the ones that you weren't very good at. And some of them got better every single time you leveled. 5th edition only improves the two you started with. The rest remain stagnant. Since you only add your proficiency bonus to saving throws you have, the four you don't have never get any better from level 1 unless you raise that stat later. But the challenge rating of the monsters will keep going up, and so will the difficulty class of their abilities. If you're a fighter with a wisdom of 12, you get a plus 1 to your save for the next 19 levels. Passing an early DC 12 saving throw is a 50-50 shot. But as you hit higher levels and the monsters get harder, now you're trying to hit a 17 plus saving throw, meaning your chance of success drops significantly. You typically need outside help in the form of spells or else you're going to be failing a lot of saving throws. If you want to fix this issue, you need a way for characters to gain new skills or saving throws as they level. Include the option to gain proficiencies and saves as part of an ability score increase. Basically, you're taking the resilient feat and allowing them to take it multiple times. The problem with letting them automatically pick new saving throws as they level up is not all saving throws are created equal. That leads to... When it comes to the most important ability score, you have dexterity and a rather steep drop-off. And I'm not talking about the abilities you need for your class to work. Dexterity increases one of the most used saving throws. It affects your armor class, your initiative, your ranged weapon hit and damage, finesse weapons, and two of the most valuable skills in stealth and acrobatics. Unless you're going with two-handed weapons for your fighting style, Dexterity is much better because the rapier is superior to the longsword because of finesse. Nimble little mink, isn't she? Intelligence is considered a joke because it's useless to most classes unless you're a wizard or just want lore skills. It provides no mechanical benefits for non-wizards. Intelligence saving throws were so rare that wizards added more creatures that caused those saves. In the initial three core books, there were less than nine intelligence saving throws. It's the least used ability score by far. Just to rag on intelligence more of the spellcasting classes, four of them use charisma, three of them use wisdom, plus the monk, and the poor choice design has literally made the game dumber, as there are no mechanical penalties for a low intelligence unless you're facing a horde of mind flayers. Tasha's did add three psychic classes, but only the fighter psychic class actually uses intelligence. The rogue psyker and the sorcerer psyker do not use intelligence once. That means mechanically, taking into account the Eldritch Knight, the Arcane Archer, and the Psy Warrior, the fighter has the most use for the intelligence ability other than the wizard. The fighter. Want to know why we don't have Dark Sun? Because 5th edition psychic rules essentially blow chunks. So what's the fix? For starters, we really don't need 6 saving throws. Not saving throws for each individual ability score. If you want to go back to saving versus poison, death ray, wand, staves, or rods, that is another thing. 3rd edition got saving throws effectively correct. You had a mental, physical, and evasive save. That's all you needed. There's not much difference between wisdom, charisma, or intelligence saves. The only odd one out is strength saves, because those see some use that other ability scores can't duplicate. But you could cheat it as a pseudo-saving throw by turning it into a skill check. They need to nerf dexterity by a good margin. Are you sure? They can start by reducing the rapier to a d6 damage, so it's not on par with the longsword. Steal from Greek myth and return missile damage to your strength score. Odysseus, you know what I'm talking about here. Look at that good boy. You better have the muscle to pull back that bowstring. Crossbows would do a specific amount of damage based on their size. I know they want dexterity to reflect accuracy, but the mechanic isn't working. One combat ability should not be demonstrably better than the other option. As the rap battle between 5th edition and OSR once said, you've got three pillars of gaming, but two of them are toothpicks. And that's the next problem. I've mentioned this before and it needs repeating. 5th edition is a combat simulator with exploration and diplomacy awkwardly stapled on. The Barbarian, the wilderness beat stick type, has no exploration skills. They only get combat. That's not a wilderness warrior, that's a sports hooligan. The Ranger gets the most exploration skills that aren't just double your proficiency bonus for the perception skill. And their tracking ability applies to almost every creature type except for beasts and humanoids. The two creatures they would be best at tracking. But then there's the Bard, who is the master of diplomacy. Never mind, the most you get is your persuasion skill doubled, just like every other skill monkey. You don't get anything else to help talk to people. You get a lot of skills and bonuses to those skills, but everything you have either adds to simple skill rolls or just gives you more magic. There's no bonus to diplomacy that's not just add more numbers to a skill check. 
What do you think anybody else is getting if the bar gets nothing out of adding more numbers to a skill check to negotiate with the king? Anybody else want to negotiate? One major issue the game has is most of the diplomacy or exploration is pure pass or fail. You ask the Burgomeister for help, he either gives you what you want or he doesn't. There's no sliding scale. If you're going to stick with just a simple skill check, there needs to be bonuses for how high you roll. Use the difficulty chart, set the target number, and for every difficulty you hit above the assigned one, you get offered something else to help you with. Exploration can be done similarly, but the game has to overcome its hesitance to keep track of everything but ammo. It gives you too many things for free to help you avoid being inconvenienced, and exploration is a big recipient of that. And you need to give classes non-combat abilities that aren't just plus one to a skill roll. Give the ranger the ability to skip spending resources every other day. People say that keeping track of stuff is a pain, but here's a tip from the old days. Nothing will remind the players they have to spend a resource more than the guy that gets to ignore that rule. But what about the third pillar of game design, ignoring the fourth and fifth pillars of character development and world building because those require actual work on the part of the DM and Watsy couldn't be bothered with that. I'm talking about combat. I'm not going to talk about the disaster that is challenge rating because everybody knows that that system needs to be scrapped and rewritten. This version was supposed to be the most streamlined and most straightforward of all the combat systems. Yes, it was the easiest, I won't deny that. But it's so streamlined it's almost bare bones. Nice. Nice. Not thrilling, but nice. They took out too much. They gave rules for things that don't matter, and there's no variation in weapons. And damage types are pointless. Of the hundreds of monsters in this edition's monster manual, only eight care about non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Most of them, it's either magic weapons or nothing. A longsword is a battle axe, is a warhammer, is a morning star, is a war pick. They're all just 1d8 one-handed weapons. Unless you face a specific threat, this has zero effect on gameplay. More on that later. The worst part is they got weapons right in 3rd edition, with some weapons getting a bonus to critical damage, and others increasing critical chances, among other options. It wasn't many more rules, but they made all the weapons stand out from each other. And nothing helps you with the hit point bloat, where you're facing monsters that should die much sooner than their stats indicate. Hitting a mook three times to kill him isn't enhancing the combat, it's making things last longer. Combat is already static. If you move, you're giving away free strikes. Fighting types have no reason to move around the battlefield. It puts them at risk. So once the lines are drawn, all they get to do is to roll to hit until they've killed their foe and then they go get to stand somewhere else. Combat needs to be freeform and fun. You're moving around the battlefield rather than just saying, I swing, you swing, I swing, you swing. Shield walls look great at the start of combat, but they get tedious quickly. 3rd edition had a host of different attacks. 4th edition made it a point where there just wasn't a normal attack in combat. Even 2nd edition in Beckney gave you your options for your combat tactics at a higher level. 5th edition this only applies with specific subclasses. If you're a battle master, you've got a host of possibilities with which to stab people. Champions, not so much. Barbarians tend to be one-trick ponies. I rage, I swing. Even monks don't get much in the way of exciting stuff. Where are the grapples, the throws, and the jump kicks? <laughs> You spend a key point, or a chi point, or if you're Welsh, a key point, and you get extra slap happy. But you don't get any cool special moves. If you want to fix this, have special combat moves that you unlock every time you raise your proficiency bonus. This isn't without precedent. In Beckme, when certain combat types reach certain levels, they unlock new attacks. It's the same principle. If you're a fighter, barbarian, paladin, ranger, or fistinator, you get new special attacks that replace boring and stale basic attacks. Speaking of barbarian, Quick, what's the first thing you do every single combat? If you said anything other than go to the fridge for another coke, you're currently not playing at my table. Be honest, you said rage. And you did that, didn't you? Yes, yes you did. The answer is always rage. The only answer is rage. It's an entire class built around a single mechanic. Compare that to the second edition Barbarian with numerous options, only one of which was the get angry guy. Ranger is so weak it's married to the spell hunter's mark. Ask anybody how to fix a ranger right now, and they will tell you they have a fever, and the only solution is more Hunter's Mark. Warlocks are so dependent on Eldritch Blast to get seven invocations devoted to it. No other spell gets more than one. These are crutch mechanics. They weaken the class, and they need to go. These restrict character designs because like cross-class skills or weapon restrictions, the designer tells players how the character is meant to be played. All three of these abilities are combat-related, because of course they are, but there's so much focus given to them that there's no other options. For Barbarian, compared to 2nd edition, Gone is the Beastmaster, the Wilderness Warrior, the Primitive Warrior, the Outlander, and the All-Arounder. It's Rage Monster or nothing. There's no point in taking anything but the path they built for you. 
No dual wielding, you don't get mental abilities, it's just rage. It shouldn't be this way. And you don't have to be a gun. You are what you choose to be. One problem is, so many players only see martial types as damage outputs. It's all combat or nothing. So instead of making rangers hit harder, why not push their exploration focus? To fix the crutch mechanic problem, get rid of them. Barbarians only get rage as a subclass. Eldritch Blast is wholly gone. Rangers don't need Hunter Mark. Rewrite the classes to give them maximum versatility instead. Remember me always telling you if there's no threat to the character, there's no thrill for the reader? Because 5th edition doesn't seem to understand that. This edition has a well-deserved reputation for being pillow-fisted. You heal entirely on a long rest. Saber dice spells are gone. Now we get Saber suck and they rarely last more than a round. Figure of death is straight up damage now. Death spell is an ancient memory. If you drop to zero hit points, you have three chances to get back up or have somebody spend an action to make sure you don't die. This even applies to trying to prevent players from taking actions. Quick, how do you stop a wizard from casting a spell as a fighter? It's a good question. If you said grapple, the answer would be wrong. A restrained wizard, rules as written, can still cast spells. Only incapacitated creatures can't take actions, something that putting them in a boss and crab doesn't do. Taking away the character's abilities to do things is difficult in 5th edition. They don't want the players to feel powerless, but that hurts the DM's ability to challenge them. Few things can actually inconvenience players. Even things like magic items don't run out of charges, they just refresh. For a game obsessed with action economy, it doesn't handle the expenditure of resources well. Gone are spells that knock players out of the fight for multiple turns. Going down to zero hit points gives you no penalty if you're healed to a single point of damage. You shot me! Okay, moving on. You shot me right in the arm! Many dungeon masters have to homebrew threats to the party or throw higher than normal level monsters at them to even threaten them. And even then, most of the damage is just really big boo-boos. There's no permanent curses. You just find the remove curse spell and it's all better now. They have multiple spells to overcome death, and if something really bad happens to them, people have actually created combat wheelchairs with more special features than the Mach 5 and work better than actual legs. At least until Bartle cast Purloined Prosthesis, and now he has the super powerful combat wheelchair, and he's pushing all those cool buttons. You want to fix this issue? Bring back consequences. Let failure be an option. Threaten your players, and they will be thrilled. People complain there's not much to do in high-level play. They aren't wrong, and this is for several reasons. First, most high-level adventures in 5e have been nothing more than simple dungeon crawls. You get most of your coolest abilities at much lower levels, and then the focus is just more combat than mind-blowing epic level quests. At the highest levels, your characters should be demigods in their own right, ready to solo entire dungeons and lead armies to conquest. When you're 20th level, the only thing that can threaten you now are the most powerful extraplanar creatures and creatures on par with deities. Now you can spend all of the gold you've been hoarding, load up on all your legendary magic items, and carve a bloody path through the countless layers of the abyss. Or at least 666 of them. Yes. And no. In reality, high-level campaigns provide little for the characters because of the poor design choices I mean most of your levels are either dead levels or you get additional use of an ability you got a long time ago. This game seems to be almost afraid of giving high-level characters high-level abilities. Pop quiz. How many more spells does a 20th level wizard cast compared to a 10th level wizard? If you said 8, you would be correct. In 10 levels, you gain the ability to cast 8 additional spells. That's it. Fighters get indomitable at level 9. That's the last unique class ability they get. Everything else is just additional uses of things you got in the previous 8 levels. It doesn't help that this game offers nothing for you to spend money on. There are no rules for mass combat. So if you want to colonize the Orklands and bring civilization to the Piggy Boys, there are no rules for it. It's the same with running a domain. You're still dungeon crawlers. All the baddies are just much higher level now. There's nothing to do at high level, so players get bored. Don't think they haven't noticed. And that's because you get everything at an early level. This has caused one of the game's most significant problems with several classes that are only there for multi-class combos. Everything you want from a particular class, especially the Warlock, comes in four levels of play. This isn't a new problem. The 3.0 Ranger was notorious for this, but 5th edition takes the cake. A single level dip often gets you enough benefits to remove any flaws from another class. Does your Warlock need heavy armor? One level of Forge Cleric gives you heavy armor immediately. A level of Fighter gives you every weapon. One level of Wizard gets you a bunch of cantrips that tend to break the game due to multiclassing. If you want to play in a high level game where the players will outclass the basic monsters, have fun. Some people want to play over the top combat gods. If they didn't, the game Exalted wouldn't exist. 
But for the people wanting a more grounded classic fantasy game, this can cause a lot of strife in the party. There's a reason for that. When one person massively outclasses everyone else, the other players do not want to play with them. Feeling a little inadequate? They are there to kill monsters and take the treasure, but if one character can solo most encounters, the other characters become superfluous. When your straight-up champion fighter is watching the Warlock Paladin build solo boss monsters in a single round, it has a bad habit of reducing people's interest in playing. It's a group game, and while many people think this is the video game version of D&D, looking at you, Hasbro, it's mostly just an excuse to sit around the table and hang with your friends. How do you fix this? Spread the abilities throughout the classes better. This also improves high-level play as well. Banning multiclassing is a controversial but much-needed option. Usually there was a massive penalty for multiclassing. In 2nd edition, you temporarily lost access to your original class. 3rd edition hits you with an XP penalty if you strayed too far from your class selection. 4th edition restricted multiclassing probably more than anybody else, and it really wanted you to stay in your lane. 5th edition removed almost all restrictions to it, and it has suffered because of it. Lastly, there's just too much magic in 5th edition. Everybody gets spells now, even martial classes. In fact, Tasha's gave every subclass it introduced for fighter, rogue, and barbarian spells. For example, there are 10 fighter subclasses in 5th edition. Arcane Archer, Eldritch Knight, Psy Warrior, Rune Knight, and Echo Knight all provide fighters with magical abilities. Entirely half of the fighter classes give you spells or spell-like abilities. More races and subclasses have built-in spell or spell-like abilities than don't. If you are a martial type that doesn't get spells, all your cool fighting abilities are wasted unless you have a magical weapon, because a, a fair chunk of monsters take little or no damage unless you've got a plus one next to your little light hammer's name. Or the warlock just eldritch blasts it to death because they have a built-in magic weapon. This leads to a magical scavenger hunt for everyone who doesn't have spells. Because they forgot to include rules for buying a Beck de Corbin plus one. Yes, there is a martial caster divide. There always has been. But the answer to a fighter sword not being as powerful as a wizard spell is not to give the fighter spells. Again, this used to be addressed in previous editions by putting restrictions on the wizard to balance it out, like more XP to level up, opportunity attacks for casting point-blank spells, d4 hit points, and being unable to cast spells in armor even if they did have proficiency with them. But those are all gone because 5th edition doesn't like to tell players no. Well, I think the thing is that your ability to summon a horde of celestial super beings at will is making my BMX skills look a bit redundant. This is one of the flaws that broke 3.5, and the 5th edition managed to one-up Monty Cook's version of Wizards. If you want to play in a low magic setting, it's all but impossible. I rewrote all the races so that the base race has zero magic spells or abilities, but can gain them with sub-races. Fantasy races should be like buffalo wings. The basic race is flavorless. If you want the spicy stuff, you add that in later with the extras. Let's make a Faerun High Elf and an Orth High Elf the same elf, but with regionally specific abilities. Restrict magic using martial types to particular races, and ditto with feats that give you spells. Eldritch Knight is now an ancient elven secret. Most people don't know they even exist. It adds a level of mystery to the class and it improves your setting. Okay, I've rambled enough. Those are the flaws I see at the end of 5e. I have little faith in any of them getting fixed, but I had to be honest with myself and set down my standard for reviewing 5th or edition. 5th edition had promise. It had merit. It did nothing with either. For that reason, I'm fixing errors and rules problems with the Mastara Player's Guide, just not updating it or the Dungeon Master's Guide for the new edition. Unless they meet the demands I laid out in this video. And if you want me to look at the new 5th or 5th edition, just drop off the revised copy in the usual spot. Harris County Courthouse, 301 Fannin, behind the toilet on the third stall of the first floor men's bathroom.